Hello everyone, my name is Ray Kanopka and this is Creating Custom Fire Monkey Controls. Before we get to the actual examples of the various controls that we're going to show in this session, I do want to spend some time talking about the differences between the VCL and the FireMonkey framework. Uh, there's quite a few notable differences, and since many of us have some history of creating VCL controls, looking at that background information and comparing it to the FireMonkey framework and how it's different uh, will actually lend itself very well to an understanding of how to build these custom controls. Uh, once we look at some of those core concepts and, and the, the main classes that are involved in FireMonkey, we're going to take a closer look at what uh, primitives are all about, what role they play in FireMonkey, and why they're so important. Uh, of course, we'll be creating two uh, new primitives that we're going to leverage in our uh, custom controls as we move further uh, in the session. In addition, we're going to look at a very basic control, uh, being able to reuse a component just like we would in the VCL. What do we need to do in the fire monkey side uh, that's going to be the spin box control uh, to leverage all of the technology that's in fire monkey uh, our most advanced example is the spinner control which is going to use the full support of the styling that is built into fire monkey fortunately even though there's a, uh, a lot of new capabilities in fire monkey it leverages a lot of the same uh, base functionality that we grew up with with the VCL and uh, that's clearly evident when you look at the base uh, ancestor classes of T object persistent and T component uh, they're the same ones uh, however it gets interesting when you start dropping below that so if we look at the VCL class hierarchy here uh, we can see uh, the base classes of, of being what we would expect them, the T components the same. Uh, T control is really what drives the, the visual side of things. So whether we have uh, graphic controls and wind controls, the graphics are really no window handle, no container ship, uh, keyboard focus and, and so forth is on the wind control side and then custom control. Um, they're all controls, there's no real separation other than an implementation detail. Looking over into FireMonkey, uh, the base looks very similar. Uh, you still have T component and your non visual controls hang off of that. But then all FireMonkey visual controls uh, are, that are involved in styling and, and building of things is driven by the TFMX object. Uh, and then a direct descendant of that is T control. So it, there is a T control on both sides, but they're quite different. Um, underneath T control, you have two sets of classes. You have shapes uh, and styled controls, and the shapes are what are called primitives in FireMonkey. They're the pieces we're going to use to put together, and it's like that canonical object-oriented example we all saw in our education books learning object-oriented programming, um, so shapes and rectangles and so forth. The styled controls has all the functionality to be styled, to have a custom style register for it uh, as well as being able to change out a style of a given control. So digging in a little bit deeper and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this just because some of it's uh, we can pick it up pretty quickly uh, the event model is the same so you'll have T notify event and, and all of the other uh, eventing that's familiar persistence is shared uh, the same persistence mechanism collections and streaming and all of that uh, there's no component messages uh, there's there's no need for them um, because of the compositing rendering that's used by FireMonkey uh, you really don't have to worry about notifications not moving up and down a parenting chain uh, the coordinate system is still upper left on both sides however VCL is integer based and FireMonkey is floating point so you'll see lots of floating point numbers uh, there are property changes at various points inside of the two frameworks. Uh, caption changes to text in many cases. Uh, the position uh, property replaces uh, left and top. There's a position X, Y on 3D spaces. There's a Z value, which is why they did that. Um, owners, parents, and children, uh, same concept of ownership. So if, if a control owns another control, it's going to take care of uh, cleaning that up. Uh, parenting is also available on FireMonkey, but it's not quite the same. It doesn't have to deal directly with a window handle, which is what 
the VCL's parent is related to. Uh, any parent can, any control can be the parent of another control. For example, you could have an edit be the parent of a label. Now, you wouldn't necessarily want the label inside the edit, but it could reside on the outside. And where parenting comes into play is that the, any, the properties that affect the parent also affect the children. So if you hide a parent control, all of the children will be hidden automatically. If you change the opacity of a parent to 0.5, all the children's opacity will change as well. There is a T canvas in FireMonkey. Uh, it's a bit different than the VCL. It's a little bit more abstract. Uh, ultimately, it does get down to a device context layer. But uh, instead of dealing with a lot of different method calls, it's really designed for dealing with two objects, a fill and a stroke. And there's settings on each of those. And there's corresponding methods that are used to draw uh, a given shape or segment using a fill and a stroke. So there's a fill rectangle, a fill rect and a draw rect. The fill does the interior, the draw uses the stroke settings to, to draw itself. Uh, text is also available in both modes. You can fill text so that gives you the ability to have a gradient uh, fill on your text elements. Um, and even though there's a T canvas directly, we will typically not use it to the extent that we did in the VCL. We'll use, we'll set up primitives and tell the canvas to simply print those primitives or display those primitives. T control represents any visual control that's in FireMonkey. And so you have a whole slew of all the different uh, elements and pieces that uh, make up that functionality. So uh, mouse and keyboard interactions, all the visibility and appearance settings, uh, focus and triggers, uh, all of that is, is encapsulated into T control. Below T control is where we start getting to the primitives. That's the shape. Um, so T shape includes a fill and stroke settings. Um, when we ever, whenever they need to be used during their paint routine, uh, the primitive will actually copy the settings of its shape into the corresponding canvas. So the canvas, when you make a call like draw a path, for example, it knows what to use. Um, and so uh, th this whole idea of primitives is very powerful in, in, in building up our, uh, our displays. So to start, uh, I'm going to switch over to code. And what we want to take a look at, um, first, we're going to start with some custom primitives. We're going to add to the shape library, if you will, um, some common things that you may find uh, a need to reuse, as, as I did. And then uh, we're going to put one of those uh, primitives to work in our first custom control. So here we have Delphi XE3. And in this example, um, I started out, uh, I want to make a couple new primitives. I've got a new unit called RK Shapes. I'm going to make my triangle and my arrow uh, primitives in here. And one of the easiest ways to get started is, is I'm not even going to worry about uh, trying to create a package yet or install it into the IDE will eventually get there, but to test the behavior, we can do all of that in a, a runtime, uh, just a little test app. So I've created a FireMonkey application, and it's pretty straightforward if we bring up the, the form. I, I've got a, a little background image here I'm going to use to test some transparency. And um, when I go ahead and f create this application, we're going to create a new instance of our triangle primitive, and I'll show you the code of that in a second, but you get the idea of what it's going to do. Uh, it looks just like the VCL structure. That's because the T component class is the same. So we still pass ownership. We still set the parent uh, to this will cause uh, the visibility and all the other hierarchy things to, to propagate up and down. We set up our height and width. And in this case, I'm, I'm setting up some uh, where I want to position it, the rotation angle, and other settings that I can add on to this particular control. So before we run that, let's take a quick look at what the shape class looks like. So very simply, it, uh, the triangle descends directly from the shape. Uh, we're going to need to include the, uh, the FMX types and the FMX objects for this particular example. That's what's being used. Um, and to hold uh, the triangle's points, 
there's three of them obviously we're going to use a, a path to do that and so we're going to have a, a field that's going to hold our path data essentially the three points that represent the triangle and then um, we're going to need to do have a paint because our primitives do the paint they're going to communicate with a canvas to do the the actual work uh, and we're going to have a constructor and destructor of course to create the path data structure as well as to release it. Um, I've commented out this point in object function to start just because I want to add that back in in a minute and we can see what it's useful for. But aside from that, there isn't a whole lot more that's needed. What we have left is a number of properties uh, that have been inherited in. A couple notes to, to highlight here. If you're looking at the FireMonkey source code, you may see a number of properties that have redefined defaults listed in their definition. Um, for example, clip parent has set the default as false. Uh, I found these into the source code. Uh, interestingly enough, the values do not change from their base class, so there really is no need to override them again, and they're not being reset to these default values in the class itself, so uh, it, it seemed a little redundant, and I just cleaned that up uh, for what we want. But we're going to surface properties that we inherit from the ancestor class as needed. So if I wanted to bring rotation angle and center and scaling. Uh, one thing to note is starting with XE3, there were a number of separate stroke properties from XE2. Uh, they have been deprecated. Uh, they're still available. They simply manipulate the stroke uh, property, which is uh, has sub properties now to handle these same types of things and when we think about our primitives really got two main pieces to it it's got the stroke the outline settings and it's got the fill which is the interior and then the rest is really just standard functions so let's take a look at uh, how, how we create this triangle so starting with the constructor we're going to create our path data we free it and then there's a function called update path and update path we're going to call whenever we really want to paint the path. We want to make sure we have it set to have the right data in it. So we're going to clear the path data and then we're going to have, pick a starting point for the first item in the path and then add to it and describe how the path is going to be created. So in this case we're going to start in the upper left position of this object. Remember we still have a square or a rectangular bounding area so zero zero is the upper left. We're going to draw the arrow if, or the triangle to the right almost it points to the midpoint so on the far right edge to the width halfway down is going to be the, the point of the triangle. We're then going to bring the, the third point to the left edge down at the bottom and then by calling close path we have a closed shape we don't have to worry about adding a further point back to the original one so this establishes what we're what shape we're going to draw if we wanted more than just a triangle we could add more points to this as necessary which is really what our arrow is going to do in a minute looking at the paint routine we call update path to do the start uh, shapes have no ancestor paint method there's nothing that needs to be called so that's why you don't see inherited here uh, and what we're going to do is uh, this one step here this canvas fill of the assignment taking the, the, the fill settings of the uh, component itself we need to do that manually the, the stroke is taken care of for us by the base class and ultimately the fill should as well but it currently doesn't and so we can manually take care of that and then um, really the next step is to tell the canvas to fill the path of our path data and draw the path and typically you're going to do it in this order where you want to fill the interior and then draw because the drawing may go uh, center itself especially of a thick line it will center itself around the actual path uh, line that's there uh, absolute opacity is um, 
it's a calculation that FireMonkey will do to determine what is the appropriate opacity based on the control and all of its parents. So the control's opacity may be one, uh, but if the shape is on a form and the, the form has an opacity level of 0.5, this is what that value will be. So uh, if you're familiar with WPF, uh, you may have heard references to ambient properties. This is very much like that. So the function I commented out before, uh, this point in object, uh, where this is useful is because we have all the layering and all the transparency that's built in the FireMonkey, it's important that we don't forget to implement the point in object. And where this comes into play is uh, when we have a shape that lets some of its client area or, or background show through. So I'm going to have it not commented and let me go ahead and run this, my little test application here. And what I've done as you can see, I've got some uh, the two shapes. We'll get to that one in a minute. But if I click on my blue rectangle, I have a blue rectangle. Well, now if I click in anywhere in here, the bounding rectangle of my shape is up into this section. But if I click here, nothing actually happens. And I really want the rectangle to get the event. And the reason why that's not happening is because the point in object is still set to the base which is really everything's in the point uh, or in the path so let's go back up I'm gonna uncomment this so next I wanna actually switch over to an actual control rather than a shape uh, the shapes are functional but they're really just displaying anything there's no interactions to them they're just painting something on the screen for us uh, next I wanna create uh, really a little spin box. It's going to be a display area with uh, an increment and a decrement button. Uh, if you've seen me do any of my component uh, sessions in the past with the VCL and other technologies, uh, it's a one I like to do because it's very simple to understand yet utilizes almost every aspect of component writing that, that we have. And, and this is quite true even for FireMonkey as well. So again, I'm still not really getting into creating the the libraries and the packages we will do that but for now we don't need to let's just keep it simple to get started so I've got a new project and what we're going to do is I'm going to create an instance of the new RK spin box and uh, I do it the same way I'm going to set the bounds I'm going to set up a little event handler uh, which because we have a new event we're actually going to respond to this and each time we change the spin value we're going to put it into the edit box and so let's take a look at what this class looks like um, you know actually before I do that let me go ahead and run this real quick just so that you can see what we're talking about so this is the spin box um, notice that I move the mouse I've got two buttons here uh, when I click on one of them the focus changes to this particular control and I can click the buttons up and down and uh, I can respond to the events for that so let's see what this control and how this was made so interestingly I'm descending directly from T control we're really not going to want to build our com custom components in this manner but it does illustrate um, kind of how all of this stuff works together and so it's a good intermediate step because we're going to use the primitives as well that we created uh, in just a second. So basic spin box, it's a control, so it can serve, uh, you can function on any uh, FireMonkey form. Um, we're going to have a value uh, to store the current value of our spinner. Uh, the on change event uh, set up just like we normally would in the VCL. Uh, I've got some references here that uh, we're going to need to uh, to manage when we change the focus because we're going to want to draw the outer uh, rectangle differently. Uh, obviously we need to update some text to display the value uh, so that's why we have references to those. Uh, the event handlers, uh, we're going to see how uh, we're essentially building a composite we're going to take pieces and programmatically assemble them together to implement our various controls. So uh, let's move on to the constructor. We've got a couple properties as well. Uh, font color, of course, we may want to change the font color. We want to be able to, to do that. So let's go and look at the constructor because actually that's where most of this 
stuff resides. And in here, what's uh, unique about this is that we're actually going to create all of the pieces of that control in code. Um, very similar to what you could certainly do in the VCL, it, it's just we're using FireMonkey primitives now. Um, one of the things that's interesting is all controls can take the focus or not. Um, the only difference between a, a, a button and a speed button is that the speed button has can focus is set to false. So you can't take the, the keyboard focus for it. Uh, in this particular example, we do want the keyboard focus. So we're going to set can focus is true, initialize the, the size of the control, and we're going to start with our outer rectangle. So rather than draw the rectangle in the paint override, we're going to create a primitive, which are very lightweight, as we saw in our uh, triangle. There isn't a whole lot there. We're going to create a primitive, we're going to parent it to ourself and uh, set up the alignment to go to the whole context. We'll set up the fill and the stroke setting so it has a dark gray outside color, interior is white. Um, we're going to want to set hit test to false and this is important because normally a primitive will respond to mouse clicks. Well. In this case, we don't want that. We want all the interactions really to just go to the, to the control itself. Uh, the rectangle doesn't need to do anything special. So we're going to say hit test is false, and all mouse interactions will bypass that. The locked and stored properties that are being set here are, are actually very important when you are dynamically creating uh, a primitive or another control inside of your control. If you don't do this, what happens is, is you can create it on the, the form, register it, drop it on the form, but the minute you reload it or go to text and come back, um, the data that you have actually gets streamed out into the form file, and so you end up having copies of all the primitives, and it gets all messed up. So I've already put the code in to, to fix all of that and we have locked as, as, uh, and stored as false for each of these sub elements. So the next thing we're doing is the decrement button which is just a T button so it's the same one you would normally put if you wanted to put an OK button. We're just setting it up a little bit different, setting the parent, the width, setting up some alignment. Of course, we're, we don't want to focus the buttons even though they normally take the focus, we don't. We just want the control itself to get the focus. Uh, we can also set the repeat click to true so that as we hold it down it'll continue to invoke the event uh, and that event that we're going to uh, respond to is the on click and so we're going to set for the decrement button obviously we want to decrement the value so we're going to simply provide this uh, event handler to do that. Uh, we don't want to set the hit test as to false in this case because we do want the mouse to be processed by the actual button. Now here's where it kind of gets fun is that uh, we're using the triangle that we just created one of our new primitives and we're creating an instance of that parenting it to the button and setting its size and then setting it to be centered inside the button. One of my favorite new layouts that you get with FireMonkey. So we don't have to worry about where to position it, we just set its size and say center it inside that box, the bounding rectangle of the button, and everything's great. Now because the, the arrow points to the right and I'm on the decrement button, I need to rotate it 180 degrees so that it points to the left. Likewise, I set hit test as to false so that when I click on the arrow it actually goes to the button and picks up the mouse event there so I can continue to click on it. The increment does exactly the same thing except going the other direction and it has its own triangle pointing over to the right so you can see there's no rotation angle setting here. The final piece for this control is the text box which is going to be used to display the actual value as we click the buttons. And so here we're just setting up some alignment, the text alignment, what color to be used, and so forth. So that's most of the control that's there. Um, to do focus changes, what we do have the do enter and do exit, just like we would in the VCL. Uh, in this case, we're going to change the box primitive. We're going to change the stroke color, the outline color. 
one we're gonna we're gonna switch between steel blue and dark gray it's just the values that I sent if I wanted to make these properties to and surface them at the control level we could do that and then the user could change them um, we're going to do a totally different way to customize the appearance of a control but this gives you an idea of, of how you can do that the actual decrementing and incrementing is quite simple whenever we click one of those buttons we want to set the focus to the control itself that's the whole spin box and adjust the value so by changing the value which is causing the set value function to get called we check if it's different save it off into our field convert it to a string to display in the, in the text box call our change method which is the event dispatch method to generate the event and then we'll repaint the whole control so that everything gets updated and shows the correct states of the buttons and so forth and very end of course because we're dealing with a fire monkey class we're going to call register fmx classes for this particular class in case we want to use this in a style of some manner um, note that this is not the same as the register procedure to register components inside the IDE um, that's still done in a register call what I recommend is in the registration unit and I will show those um, when we come to next and and package all of this up into uh, the, the style control next up is this T styled control which is really the direction we want to head uh, inside this base class it gives us all the functionality to support styles uh, the lookup of styles the style lookup property uh, supporting styles to other consumers with the style name property uh, as component writers we're going to use the get style object function to actually load uh, our style out of the resource and then connect it to our controls inside the apply style uh, over Override as well. Each control has its own default style, which is hard coded per platform. Uh, it gives it a nice native look and feel to it. Uh, they're defined as component trees, so you have the parenting relationships between all the components and subcomponents and primitives. Uh, they're embedded as resources, as I mentioned before, and we can customize them programmatically or via the style designer. To create your own style, um, you can use uh, the form designer in a fire monkey form or you can use the style designer uh, each has their own pros and cons um, if you can use the style designer uh, it is a little bit easier in the sense that it saves directly to a style file you just have to remove the outer layout that gets stored automatically for it uh, and then be sure to refresh the display quite a bit uh, so apply and save and then alt f12 and then come back and everything uh, syncs up much better that way uh, and then you can use separate uh, style files to handle platform differences so win.style versus mac.style so let's take a look switch back over to uh, Delphi here and uh, what I've started with is here this looks like our spinner right well it's actually just a panel and the panel I've created a, a custom style for it and it's in my style book here and I've called it the RK spinner style and that's the default name of a style for a control so you take the component the class that represents the control TRK spinner drop the T add style and that's going to be the default name and how I've made this up and this is the style designer uh, I've got my structure pane and I've got a bunch of primitives and other base controls that I've assembled to be this setting and now all I'm doing here is laying out the, the pieces of the style there's no real functionality um, although there's a little bit of animation when uh, I'm animating the color based on whether it's focused or not and so uh, th those are types of things that we can do based on triggers so I've added my two buttons my increment decrement button the buttons themselves have the the, the triangles on each one so that we can uh, see which direction they go and I've filled those with uh, some gradients uh, the text areas in the middle needed as well so the names that show up are all coming from the style name so style name is text and so forth now 
as we look into the code for this which is I'm moving into next so I've set up my my general style I can use the save button to save this to a file and um, and then use this so let me switch over uh, to what that looks like if I go ahead and do the save so here is the style setting that uh, style file that I created and as you can see it's it looks like the DFM format here uh, and it's that layout that I created in that uh, that style setting now one thing that this doesn't have is there's an outer T layout uh, that goes outside of this and you just need to delete that and then take the inner ones and everything in between um, and so that's picked up the style there and I've created a Mac version and then I need to have a resource which simply references that style file as the name of the style class so the RK spinner style brings in this RC data for the Windows version now let's take a look at the actual code that we're going to use so in this one I'm going to again start with a runtime package or a runtime program to test it and then we'll load it up into an actual package and so forth so if we bring into our spinner here and the test spinner looks real similar to the other one I did with the spin box that's because it does look kind of the same it's going to have in uh, setting it up and we can change the font colors and so forth uh, I'm updating the the spin value as well so let's take a look and see what the class itself looks like you will see that it's it's very similar to the spin box except we won't have a lot of the ancillary uh, classes and references that we did before we still have a value to represent that I've added an increment value uh, we're still gonna have our button clicks uh, we have two button references here that are going to connect to whatever buttons are used in the style and so we'll look at that in just a second this get style object and apply style we'll look at those uh, as we get down that's going to be how we load up the style from the various pieces for our keyboard operations and the event handlers those are this typical functionality points that we need and I've added in the various properties but let's jump and go to the constructor and see where all this starts off so like we did before we're going to allow the focus to go to the control we set up its size set up the increment and the value nothing really to destroy but how do we get the style well there's a function called get style object that will get called when the style object of your class is needed and so we're going to initialize it to the default if style lookup is empty so if that is then we're going to use the RK spinner style which is what we set up in the resource value that gets added in Oh, I should point out right above the class we have the if def Mac OS and FMS Windows we bring in the right version either the Windows resource or the Mac resource of the style gets brought in through that statement so now we're gonna load up the correct one and we can see that there's the rest of the code is just loading it is RC data if there's a style lookup that's referenced well we're just going to call the inherited version and it's going to find the right one that's needed once the style object is loaded which is the resource then apply style gets called and apply style as I mentioned before is how we connect our codes functionality to the elements in the style and so there's a couple interesting points here the first is that we need to assign the button clicks to this the buttons that are in the style so we're gonna try to find the style resource called deck button which is named in the style name of the button for the decrement likewise the ink button is also in that style and these are in the de default style now if someone were to override these particular controls you know these styles these two fields are important that they must exist inside of a custom style because this is essentially a contract between this code the RK spinner class and the style that happens to be used for it so if they're not present then we will never set up the right event handler and will never increment or decrement the value which is not the functionality that you would want to have happen 
Uh, another thing that note is that we this class instead of descending from T control, uh, I should have pointed out this before, uh, descends from T text control. And so T text control requires a, a field, uh, a style member called text. So I made sure that we have one inside of the style setting so that whenever we update the text property, there's something to display that value. All right, so style object, apply style, freestyle, whenever that gets called, we just want to let go of our, our references to the style elements that are in there. The decrement and increment, we're just going to change the value just like we did before. Um, nothing earth shattering there. The difference here is that rather than update the text box directly, we are using the text property that we inherit and it's going to put that text value into whatever style entry is set up for that uh, for that uh, named class which is the T text reference and then the keyboard operations so if it's key up or it's key down we, we do the same thing and of course register your classes there and so um, what's nice is that gives us this um, a, a control that we can use it's fully functional so I can go ahead and run this and it has all the capabilities. It's got the focus change, the keyboard's working as I click up and down. Um, everything's the uh, way I expect it to. However, what we now have is a styled control. So let me switch over to my style form. And in this case, these are the same control. So in this, this is still a TRK spinner, except I've customized the style for it. So if I go and open up the style, the, the RK spinner one style one has a background that's set up in the middle there. I've moved the buttons. So instead of being on left and right, I've moved them to be the top and bottom, and I've changed the triangle to the arrow primitive that we created. And then each of the different buttons, um, there's two of them because I'm rounding the side that's away from the interior. And so I'm not going to go through all the steps. Uh, you can certainly look at all the source code that I'm providing with this um, to see how we set all of that up. But what's nice is that by doing all of that, we can get some very visual controls um, inside of uh, customize the display, but still have the base functionality. So when we start talking about styled controls, you really start thinking about, well, what does it mean to be a button? What does it mean to be a spinner? Well, it's two things to increment and decrement and in some place to display it. Well, that's essentially what we have here. How we make that look is totally up to the user, as in this case, in this example. And so uh, what I've done is I go ahead and run this, and I can see if I start with this, and I can use the arrow keys, and I can change the different values and ch tweak the values as, as needed. And so it's, uh, it's quite cool to be able to have an alternate uh, display uh, in that piece. Uh, I will point out uh, and just mention in passing because we're running out of time, uh, is that I do have a runtime package as well as design package for all these codes. Uh, the source directory contains the runtime package that includes all the units. Uh, there's also a registration unit for registering all of the different primitives and, and so forth that, uh, that I've, I've demonstrated here today. So with that, I hope this gives you a real good idea of all the capabilities that are available inside of a styled control. And a couple final comments. Uh, definitely use styles in your custom FireMonkey uh, controls. Uh, name them appropriately and be sure to document any things that you're connecting to. So if you are looking for a control in your code to hook up event handlers and so forth, you need to let users of that control know that. Uh, utilize primitives. Uh, so set up the primitives, build them up together, use you know as composites, and then uh, what's nice is that rather than be method calls by being primitives, uh, they can be replaced. You, we replace the triangle with the arrow, for example, was an illustration of that. 
Again, complex controls can be built through code or through styled components. And that's all the information and time I have today. Uh, thank you for joining and listening in all to this. Uh, I will now switch over and, and join you with the live uh, question and answer period. Thank you very much. I saw you were answering some of the questions. Um, let's see. Oh, Alf was saying, Ray, I also, I also like that someone else puts begin on its own line instead of at the end of the line. Uh, yeah, I, I got a, a kick out of that. There were we had a little couple little comments that came in regarding the code formatting that I I use for my examples. Uh, it's it's a practice I've adopted for for many years. Pretty standard, actually, kind of all stemmed from the the, the kind of original Delphi source code. Um, I just tweaked it over the years to add a little bit more white space between method calls and even around parens to make it much clearer to, to identify the, the code. So I, I definitely appreciate some people uh, noticed that as well. Uh, let's see, Ray is just a fantastic speaker as always. That was Marcus. Are you? Uh, Larry is asking, are you thinking of writing a new book to cover FireMonkey component development or updating your current one to include a section on FireMonkey? Uh, I am de definitely thinking of, of some way to get this information out. Uh, the exact format of that, whether it's a, uh, it, well, it, it'll probably be something new. It won't be just an add-on to the, you know, the original component book I did for the VCL. There's plenty of new material. Uh, I'm really trying to come up with the, basically the fastest way that, that balances with my time commitments and getting some information out. Um, that could take the form as, as a series of short, you know, kind of smaller books. It could be one large thing. It may end up being just an online presence that, as as time permits, I can add you know these topics and dig deeper into them uh, rather than try to put together a whole big book. Uh, it's the biggest challenge right now is just the time commitment involved. But uh, I, I definitely see the relationship to back in, in 1995 when people were first getting exposed to the VCL and trying to figure out how it all works and what we can do to leverage it. So definitely having some fun digging into all this. Yep, and Ray has put the code up. That's in the Q question and answer log. Oh, where did it go? I scrolled up. That was bad. Okay, let's see. Um, oh, here it is. Uh, www.raise.com -E slash sessions with capital S, FireMonkey with and it's firemonkeycontrols.zip, capital F, yep. capital M, capital C, if, if case is sensitive or not on the I don't server. think the case matters, but uh, yeah, yeah other than that, that, that zip file contains all the source files that I was showing in the uh, the examples there, so all the packages, the component units, and, and so forth, mm -hmm. so definitely a good way to, to get started with that. Yeah. And of course, this replay and the Q&A will get put up as soon as I can. Again, it's... Uh, I also have to vote this afternoon sometime at the end. Um, let's see. I'm trying to create a virtual keyboard control for Windows. It is inherited from T style control. It's style based of a layout and a style of T my button. I'm going to make all the buttons on the keyboard look like the style of T my button. Whenever I change the style, all buttons should change too. Now, yeah. how, can, <laughs> how can I make a get style object method load the style of my button? That making the keyboard itself look like a button. Mm. Um, mm. This is it's it's actually a great question because it, it is is very similar to something that I wanted to do in my original version of the spinner. One of the things that and unfortunately I don't have an exact answer right at the moment for what what's what I interpret as being asked and specifically it's my original plan for the spinner and the spin box for that matter was to actually inside of my style that I was setting up for the spinner which controlled the the value area and the two buttons I, I I needed them to be buttons because they needed to take the focus. I needed to be able to click on them and, and do things so that they were really T button instances. But I wanted to style those buttons right off the bat inside of my default style. So I would have a style setting for the box area and then I would have and the container ship and then I would also have 
basically a, a sibling style that my T button reference in the style would do a style lookup to the sibling style. The problem is is that this the code that does the, the get style object and does all the lookup can't find the sibling styles in this process. Uh, tried a couple different ways to try to get that to work and none of them ever did. Um, it's a little bit different inside the FireMonkey controls. There's a spin box component and it does essentially what I was wanting to do. Basically, you want to style the button inside of your own style. The difference with that is is that there is no get style object override at the individual control levels. It gets inherited by a base class. And I know, David, you're not going to get all this typed in, but in the replay, maybe they're picking it up. But in the base class of a styled control, it will look to certain default styles to, to do the mappings. Well, those custom style mappings are available in the base uh, Windows 7 or Windows 8 FireMonkey style settings that all the controls have access to. The problem is is that you can't mimic the same technique currently with your own custom control. So you end up getting the default standard button and then you can go and customize it after the fact but ultimately I think that's something that will be improved in the future in an update. Yeah, I, I, you know, I get lost in some of the things. I remember, I think it was in Fire Monkey One. Was it Update Three or Update Four? That support for merging styles. Because you had this issue where if I had dark style and then I created my own custom dark style and I built components that use those that custom style, or a customized dark style, and I kept it the same name, and everybody else had their own. How did they all collide, and how can you use them all? And there, right. I remember there was this pattern, which was like, then I'd have to put dark dot, let's say, RK dot style for the Ray Kanopka dark style extensions, and sure. the Pharma, you would merge them all together so that you ended up with the right styles. But I got lost in all of that and how it works. Yeah, exactly. I think, and, yeah. and what, what's, I think is with the potential where all this go, goes to is that if you're going to use the, and you're going to set up default styles, th there's nothing that really prevents the base FireMonkey classes from picking up and loading your default style as long as it's being added in as a resource appropriately. Uh, it's just, it, it all is driven by where the, the, the classes look for the resource information and how it maps to it. And, and right now it's not quite uh, as complete as I would like it you have to do these workarounds to get that effect that you want, uh, which is okay. It's just uh, we can do a lot more as we get more uh, uh, refinement into the, the loading of the resources and the mapping of all of that. Yeah, Cla Claudia, Claudia, I can, I'm not saying this right, wants to know how to get access to the lower level canvas. So, for example, if he's running on something that's OpenGL like on Macintosh, um, or 3D, for example. I know there's a canvas object. I'm not sure how to get, if you even can get as a component developer or as a developer to the lower level OpenGL canvas or context. It might be possible. I'm just not sure how. Yeah, I haven't had a need to, to do that. So I don't know. I've been trying to look at uh, in, in certain situations where you want to you know you know you're running under windows and you've made that determination and you want to drop down a little bit lower to get some information you know how far you can drop down and how you know what you're prevented from doing um, I haven't dug into you know digging in for the OpenGL you know getting direct access to some of the lower level functionality it may be possible but uh, a lot of it's going to be looking at the platform and the the, the T canvas class and so forth inside of FireMonkey. You might sure also take, you might also take they they might also take a look. There's now the there's a canvas service, a context service, so you can see if there is a context on a certain platform and a and a canvas, and then use that uh, service interface in FireMonkey too. So you might check that out. Uh, what what does register FMX classes do? Matt is asking. 
So the the register, I, I mentioned it briefly uh, in in the session, um, but it's it's definitely easy to to overlook and miss. And I ran into this uh, doing creating one of the, the the samples here with the primitives, the triangle and the arrow that I created. When because the styles that you create, whether they're custom or default, are are stored essentially in the streaming format that we're familiar with from just Delphi in general they have object references inside of the streaming code. So when you see a T rectangle reference, well, the, the streaming code that loads that style into memory from either a resource or a file, it, it sees that object and has to know how to construct it. For a form, even VCL form and FireMonkey for that matter, you've dropped a control down, the unit's been added to the uses clause and, and everybody's everything's great. Well, in a style, that doesn't always apply. You may not actually have an instance of that particular object that you've dropped onto the form. The form might not have a rectangle at all anywhere on it, but you're using a style that's referencing a rectangle. In, in my examples, it's really the triangles that I created. I don't have a triangle that's dropped anywhere. So because it's not being used, the streaming engine doesn't know anything about the triangle. So in the unit where I define the primitives, um, and this is very common in the FireMonkey classes in the initialization, is to register the new class with FireMonkey. So that's where the register FMX classes does, is it essentially tells the streaming engine, hey, here's a class and this is how it's defined, so that if you run into it when you're loading a custom style, you know how to handle it. Almost all of the classes in FireMonkey have a corresponding register FMX classes entry in the unit that defines them. Uh, the one exception that I found is the T corner button class. That does not show up in a register FMX classes call, um, which, so if you, if you do use that in a style, you'll get an issue when you try to load it. If your form doesn't already have one, it'll come up with a class not registered and it won't know what to do with it. But that's the importance of it. Yeah, I just uh, downloaded the zip file of the control. So here's the uh, the URL. Sorry, I made a little mistake when I had a typo there. But uh, how to have a style of a custom control inside the style of a, another style of a custom control. So it's really a question about controls within controls. And they can have the well. It, 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 it's actually very similar to the, the the topic I was talking about before, which is exactly what I was trying to do. Right now, there you can set it up. The one way I was able to to get make a little bit of progress on it was to actually in the get style object override, actually load up both resources for the styles. Actually separate them out. The, but that led to other problems and it really didn't get you to what you want. I mean, ideally you could create a style that can contain multiple objects. It doesn't have to be single rooted. Right now the way the custom, con if you write a custom control and the style that you create for that custom control, the the first object that's listed in the file is the one that gets used to drive that control. If you try to put other styles in there and they're not rooted off the same base element, they essentially get ignored. They, they, they're not accessible, which is really what the root cause of the problem is. If you try to embed them in, that gets to be problematic because they affect the layout and the other abilities inside of it. So at, at this point, there's no real good solution to that particular problem. Um, but it is certainly possible because the FireMonkey base controls do it. It's just, but they're loading the resources differently than the custom control writers are having to load the resources. That's the fundamental change. A couple of people asked if you're coming out with a Fire Monkey version of raised components. Uh, it would. The we are definitely looking at what's the best way we can support Fire Monkey with uh, a component type product. Um, 
I, I don't say that we're going to be porting raised components because raised components is, is intimately tied to the VCL and it, and it fills gaps and goals that we believe that we add a lot of value to that framework. Fire Monkey has different design principles and different gaps, if you will, different areas where we can leverage it more. So um, while we'll certainly have things that are inspired by raised components, um, it, it'll be a, a kind of a specific product for Fire Monkey to add value to it. Absolutely. Thanks, Ray. Oh, you're welcome.